Hello, everyone, and welcome to Plenary Two of the Development Studies Association Conference 2021. My name is Rob Tell Nijay Paley, and I am Assistant Professor in International Social and Public Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science, as well as Chair of this plenary, which is entitled Race and Development. What's so unsettling? Now, if you've been following deliberations of the DSA 2021 so far, you know that the term, what's so unsettling, is actually a play on the conference theme, unsettling development. So we want to actually unpack what that actually means during our discussion. This plenary is a culmination of a three-part roundtable series on race and development held this week and organized by the newly formed Race and Development Working Group. But before I tell you a bit about the roundtable series, the working group and the state of play for this plenary too, we're going to hear from our plenary sponsor, Oxford Development Studies. Nandini Guptu, the mic is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Rob Tail. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this plenary session on behalf of Oxford Development Studies. ODS is delighted and excited to sponsor this very important discussion on race and development. I would like to take this opportunity to say a few words about ODS. We relaunched the journal last year with some significant changes. As a development studies journal based in the global north, we have naturally been concerned about the asymmetries between the global north and the south in knowledge production and circulation. We therefore decided to take the journal in a new direction in order to ensure the representation of the widest possible range of voices and to include those who tend to get marginalized in academic publications. To this end, we restructured our governance and organization. In place of our previous editorial boards, we constituted a new international editorial advisory board with the vast majority of members drawn from scholars based in the global south. We also took this opportunity to rebalance the gender composition. We have invited and mandated our new board members to play an active role in recruiting and encouraging a diverse range of scholars to contribute to the journal. This appears to be bearing fruit. Our submissions from the global south have gone up, especially Asia and Africa. As for Latin America, we acted on the advice of the International Advisory Board to, to launch a new pilot project to welcome submission of articles written in the Spanish language. English translations of accepted papers will be published in ODS at no cost to the author. We are also launching online training sessions on journal paper writing for early career researchers in Global South countries. Of course, we will continue to eagerly welcome strong contributions for scho from scholars based in the Global North and would like to urge you to submit papers to us. Our reorganization has entailed the formation of a small team of active editors to manage submitted articles efficiently and swiftly and to give strong editorial support to authors, especially early career researchers and authors from the Global South. Our average turnaround time for decisions on submitted articles is above average for the sector. It's about 51 days. Moreover, the disciplinary expertise of our editorial team covers all social science subjects and, and interdisciplinary development studies. It is sometimes wrongly thought that ODS favors economics, but in fact, we proactively seek submissions from all disciplines. I would like to flag up the Sanjay Lal prizes. These are awarded annually for the best article on any subject published in ODS. And one of these awards is earmarked for doctoral students. Finally, with our relaunch, we inaugurated a new series of articles entitled Critical Issues in Development Studies, intended to reflect critically on key themes and challenges in development and help set the agenda for future research. We would very much like to hear from you if you wish to propose a contribution to this series. I shall now hand back to Rob Tell to start the panel discussion that we are all waiting for. Thank you. Thank you, Nandini, for those words. And it's really exciting to hear about all the restructuring and reformatting that you're doing at ODS. We hope that other development studies journals will follow suit. And we're particularly grateful to ODS for sponsoring Plenary 2 in our discussion henceforth. So the organizers of this plenary are actually co-founders of the Race and Development Working Group, including myself, 
Jenna Marshall, Kamna Patel, Kalpana Wilson, and Althea Maria Rivas, all of whom you will hear from a little bit later. The working group was founded in September 2020 as a platform for scholars, practitioners, as well as policymakers of development to engage in really in-depth in discussions about how race and racism fundamentally shape the contours of development. If you're working on race in and development and would like to be in touch with us, please do tell us more about you and your work using the Google form in the Zoom chat function that I believe one of my colleagues is gonna post very shortly if they haven't already. We are especially excited, delighted, thrilled to be in conversation today with Amanda Mukwashi of Christian Aid, our discussant. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us and gracing us with your presence. In today's plenary, we will reflect on how race and racism are foundational to the study and practice of development and on, on, on how centering race can actually challenge and or subvert mainstream as well as critical frameworks of development. During this time, we invite you scholars, practitioners and policymakers to engage in self-reflective thinking about the need for not only individual but also institutional transformation. So effectively moving from the personal to the collective. Now, before I formally introduce the panel and the discussant, I'd like to alert you to a few housekeeping issues. The first is that we ask that you kindly turn off your mics and cameras for the first section of the plenary when the speakers are in conversation. If the conversation moves you and you'd like to interject with a comment or a question, please feel free to use the Zoom chat function. I will bring up as many of these comments and questions as possible during the discussion. Now I have to say um, upfront that I am an incredibly, incredibly bad technophobe, so I won't be able to navigate between WUVA and Zoom, but if you do put your questions and comments in the Zoom chat function, I will, I will address those as much as I possibly can. Now, if during the audience Q&A, you'd like to actually ask your question verbally, please raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. If you are tweeting, our hashtag is DSA2021. Now we will begin the discussion with reflections from the three-part roundtable series chairs invite Amanda to reflect on her work as a practitioner of development, converse amongst ourselves for a little bit before opening up the discussion to the audience. Now, roundtable one in our series was titled Racialized Ways of Knowing Development. It was chaired by Jenna Marshall, who is Senior Researcher for Development Policy and Postcolonial Studies at the University of Kessel, and Kamna Patel, Associate Professor in the Development Planning Unit, University College London. Jenna is the co-editor of the forthcoming International Affairs 100th anniversary special issue entitled The Racialized and Colonial Power Dynamics of Academic Practitioner Knowledge Exchange. I encourage you to watch out for that particular publication. Kamna is author of the 2020 Third World Quarterly article, Race and a Decolonial Turn in Development Studies. I encourage you to get that publication as soon as possible and read as much as you can of it. Um, Jenna and Kamna, you basically kicked off our roundtable series, and that was not a, a it was a pretty big, big um, stepping stone for us as the Race and Development Working Group. Can you share some reflections, thoughts, ideas from that particular panel? Any salient points that you that came up that you thought are particularly important for the plenary to hear about? I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rob Tell, and thank you to everyone for tuning in for today's plenary. So our panelists were Jamima Pierre, who's an Associate Professor of African American Studies and Anthropology at UCLA, Clive Gabe, a reader in international politics at Queen Mary, Eloise Weber, who I see in the chat is, is in this session here as well, who's a Senior Lecturer of, of social, Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland, and Zuleka Sheikh, who's a PhD candidate at the at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So our panel, which was on racialized ways of knowing development, as, as Rob Tell mentioned, the aims of our panel were to unpack, rather than to directly answer, questions on how development is known. So what is the epistemic project of development? Who's allowed entry into knowing development and for whom is this space foreclosed? So in these last two questions around access predominantly, 
how knowledge is racialized is actually very acute and it's highly visible in the politics of representation. But it would be a missed opportunity to engage only with questions of representation at the expense of thinking of development as an epistemic project. And I'm stressing this, this point because I think we'll get to this a little bit later as well, that the distinctions that are made between big D and little d development become quite salient in this. So where the former is big D development is where racism resides and the latter is regarded as our salvation. The lines, and I don't think that there are clear lines to be drawn between them at all, become evidently blurred when we think through how development is known and the epistemic project that is advanced through a particular framing over another. Now, this became quite apparent in some of the comments of Clive Gabe, who spoke of a racial anxiety and mythologizing subjects. He said, Western history must have a legacy. Now, this may or may not reside within the imagined confines of a development industry. There were three key themes that Jenna and I would like to pick up that emerged from our discussions to raise briefly here. They, those are themes of silence, dignity, and appropriation. So speaking around silence, and this was acutely described by Zuleika, there is a silence on race and development, and its absence from the curriculum, from methodological approaches to the study and practices of development, and how we revisit the canon. This manifests in incomplete engagements with some of the mainstays of development concepts, such as community and voice, and their relationships to institutions, and insurmountable power relations that are grounded in racist colonial architectures and their legacy, both within the industrial development complex and within higher education institutions where many of us are, um, are based. Yet on this point of silence, these panels on race and development have been some of the best attended at this conference. So there is very clearly an appetite to think on this. But as Jamima pointed out with reference to anthropology, there are dangers in regarding having the conversation as doing the work or institutional space being created for these conversations as a sign of meaningful commitment. Spaces for uncomfortable, unsettling conversations on race, racism and development are not created. They are not a gift, they are claimed. And I would say that we have claimed them through organizing, through solidarity and through pulling the levers that we have been able to access. The second reflection is around dignity. The idea of dignity as an organizing concept for development was a recurring one. And in education, it would mean a repoliticization of critical development studies. So reflecting on the comments of Heloise particularly, it's worth asking, what is the organizing logic of development? Is it global material rearrangements? Or can there be a logic that centers dignity, and I'm adding here repair, and its attendant material needs? A development based on dignity and repair would be one situated in the historic context of indignity and harm, where racialized ways of knowing development is a foregrounded project. For the last reflection, I'm going to turn over to Jenna. Thank you so much, Kamna, and thank you again, Rocto, for sharing, and thank you for all of all of you attending. So the there were several themes that Kamna and I were discussing and, and thinking about um reflecting on today but the final theme that i'd like to reflect on is that of appropriation and particularly um the idea of corporate capture of radicalism the way in which intergovernmental organizations like the world bank like the imf are acutely aware of radical scholarship and how um they work to appropriate this language um in the justification of uh, in a lot of their interventions. Um, and we also chatted a bit about this idea of how this idea of a corporate capture might in turn um, be linked to discussions on decolonizing development, uh, where the colonial legacies and coloniality have been left under explained. And I think that's a really important point um, to engage with. Uh, there was also a bit of disagreement um, between uh, in the in the discussion on the role of indigenous knowledge, particularly the question of of the commodification of indigenous knowledge production, and 
whether or not when speaking of indigenous ways of knowing and being in the world, if or to what extent can these knowledges be considered for Western consumption? Um, and that such knowledges are a means of asserting one's um, autonomy, um, autonomy away from the nation state, but also away from developmentalist thinking and um, whether or not in this process of appropriating indigenous knowledges, um, is that then uh, a, an afflicting of the colonial wound um, in, in, in the work that we're doing, you yeah? know? So sorry if I wasn't very clear there, but um, I think I will, I will end there and hand back over to Rob Tell. Jenna and Kamna, thank you so much. I mean, it's so difficult to summarize such a rich discussion. Of, and I see Kapana and Althea raised like, you know, vigorously shaking their heads. A rich discussion of almost two hours of in, such incredibly dynamic speakers. But I think you did such a fantastic job. I mean, the takeaways that I come up with are the, the, the triad, right? So what, what, is a, what, what are racialized ways of knowing development? It really boils down to the idea of silencing, dignity and appropriation. So I think you summed it up beautifully, actually. We'll come back to these issues. I mean, I think one of the panelists said during the discussion, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't remember the exact person, but reframing development as a politics of dignity, you know, not thinking about it as, you know, privileging Western whiteness or modernity or even capitalist um, production, but the politics of dignity, the, the simplicity of that, but the profundity of it, um, I think is, is really important. So we will come back to you. Thank you so much for sharing um, those reflections. Can we move on to uh, roundtable two, uh, which was chaired by Kapana Wilson. That roundtable was entitled Racial Capitalism, Imperialism and Development. Again, chaired by Kapana, who is a lecturer in geography at Birkbeck University of London. Kapana is author of, I would say the critically acclaimed, it's critically acclaimed by me, but I'm sure by a lot of people in the audience of the 2012 book, Race, Racism and Development, Interrogating History, Discourse and Practice. I would say it's an incredibly foundational text when we're thinking about race and racism um, across these various issues. So Kapana, please let us know what were some of the salient points that came up during your roundtable that you organized as well as chaired. I'll take it over to you. Thank you, Rob Tell. Um, so yeah, our second roundtable, as Rob Tell has said, was looking at racial capitalism, imperialism and development. And we were really focusing on um, the kinds of racialized structures of contemporary global capital accumulation in which we find that development is embedded. Um, and also how development actually enables and intensifies these kinds of racialized forms of extraction, uh, dispossession, um, as well as how this is being resisted and challenged from multiple locations. So our panel speakers in this roundtable were um, Zoe Samudzi, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Keston Perry, who is a lecturer in economics at the University of the West of England. Um, Firoz Manji, who's probably best known as the publisher of the radical publishing house, Daraja Press. And Gargi Pattacharya, who is professor of sociology at the University of East London. And these are very kind of, um, you know, limited descriptions of people who, of course, like all of our speakers, do so much more than that. Um, now, from where we stand today, um, almost a century has gone by since W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about the global color line. And nearly 50 years since the Guyanese Marxist scholar and activist Walter Rodney wrote his seminal book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Um, yet, as, as Rob Dell has said, there's only now beginning to be this discussion of racism in mainstream development arenas. And this tends to ignore both the materiality of racism and the global scope of its operations. Um, at the very most, we have some acknowledgement of the discursive legacies of colonialism, but not, perhaps unsurprisingly, of the racialized material structures and relationships of contemporary imperialism. So 
more often though, we've seen development organizations responding to questions about the structural racism embedded in their interventions by invoking the corporate language of diversity. So given all this, we felt that there's an urgent imperative to map the relationship between race and capital and what this means for development. Now, when I'm speaking about development, I'm using it quite broadly to refer to the whole complex of unequal material relationships and processes which structure engagements between the global north and the global south inextricable, of course, from the operations of global capital and from imperialism. So what is racial capitalism? Well, on the panel, Gargi Bhattacharya, uh, whose 2018 book revisited and extended this concept, explained that capitalism has always depended on racialization for its operation, and therefore we cannot seek to create a capitalism which somehow is race blind or deracialized. Building on this, um, Firoz Manji spoke of the historical uh, inextricability of liberalism and racism, in which we witnessed the racialized devaluing of some lives in relation to others. And he talked about the need to problematize the idea of the human which this generates. Um, and Keston Perry invoked the work of the iconic Jamaican philosopher Sylvia Winter who coined the term ethno-class man, the property-owning man racialized as white, a figure which remains at the core of understandings of the human in development of Anglo-Soviet. Um, and Zoe Samutsi reflected on how she chooses to think rather in terms of the person rather than this individuated and racialized human and humanity. Uh, she draws on Shona and other African philosophies to do this. A person then is defined in, a, in interaction with others and the collective rather than as an individual and has a different relation to nature, to care and to the state. So our discussion then went on to consider how development institutions continue to extend and facilitate um, racialized material processes of extraction, accumulation by dispossession, um, predatory financialization and climate injustice. And as Keston Perry argued, aid has always been racially violent and extractive, not only in the familiar forms of neoliberal conditionality, but also in apparently critical and progressive initiatives, such as the Green New Deal, um, which can be better understood in terms of climate imperialism. Reflecting on the current dramatic cuts to aid in the UK, the panel noted that maybe instead of trying to salvage aid, we should rather be thinking in terms of reparations. At the same time, seeing reparations as a purely financial process and as asking for resources misses the point. As Firoz Manji said, we need to think, start thinking of repair, of organizing to reappropriate what we've lost on multiple levels. Now, um, our panel also reflected on the conference's theme this year of unsettling development, a notion which I have to say our panelists were wary of, as all of the speakers associated it with the kinds of superficial rearrangements which are already embedded in stated commitments to diversify, localized or even decolonized development in which the underlying extractive structures remain untouched and in which ideas come to be stripped of radical potential. And drawing on Tuck and Yang's seminal piece in which they state that decolonization is not a metaphor for indigenous people, I think we also need to recognize that unsettling is not a metaphor when we consider historical and ongoing settler colonialism. We only need to think of these past months, terrible discoveries in Canada, of the ongoing war being waged against the people of Palestine, uh, and of how post-colonial states like India uh, are seeking to emulate the strategies of the Israeli state in Kashmir, for example. And the question of land and the violence of borders and containment, which is central to sustainable development, 
has been underlined again this week in the UK with the Home Secretary Preeti Patel's proposal to set up a detention center for refugees in Rwanda, which would be shared, she says, between the UK and Denmark. So settler colonialism remains central to any discussion of race and development. We thought about this more in the panel with Zoe Samudzi's discussion of her powerful work on the German colonial genocide of the Ova Herero and Nama, Nama people in what is now Namibia. She explained how the German government's recent offer of compensation in recognition of the genocide was actually simply a renaming of existing development aid flows from Germany to Namibia. Not surprisingly, described by representatives of the affected communities as insulting. Yet the state in Namibia also acts as the stewards of the compensation in what she calls an instrumentalization of trauma. Thus, as Zoe argued, we need to think of the relationship of the state to indigenous people and the way that post colonial ethno states and elites continue their dispossession of those who are minoritized. And this brought us to the wider question, and in fact, this is raised by Rob Tell in, in panel two, of how we consider the collusion with racialized capital by elites and dominant groups and classes in the global south. In this context, thinking in terms of justice, we felt, rather than simply representation, becomes imperative. And this is a point, I think, which reverberated across the panels and was crystallized uh, in yesterday's panel by Eloise Weber. Um, but there was also debate regarding the role of the state uh, in the global south and its potential as an instrument of socioeconomic transformation. It's essential, many felt, to look at states through a political economy lens, to look at what interests and alliances particular states represent, as well as through a historical lens, which reclaims and reanimates histories of anti-imperialist struggle. Um, and finally, another theme of the discussion, somewhat echoing um, what Karna and Jenna talked about in panel one, concerned the questions of resistance to racialized capitalism, the dangers of co-option and appropriation, and the urgency of solidarity. So social movements which challenge the dehumanizing logic of racialized development interventions are often rendered invisible um, within development discourses. But what are the costs when they are seen and undergo appropriation, depoliticization, and instrumentalization? While we are currently witnessing the flourishing of mutual aid with its horizontal linkages, both in the global south and in marginalized and racialized communities in the global north, there's also the process by which these have been incorporated, formalized, and segmented with social solidarity being replaced by hierarchy. And of course, the prime example of this is microfinance, which is developed, as many have written, into an instrument of incorporation of gendered labor into global accumulation processes, accompanied, I would argue, by gendered and racialized representations of women in the global south as entrepreneurial, altruistic subjects having an infinitely elastic capacity for labor. More generally, as Garvi Bhattacharya argued on the panel, this relates to how social goods and practices held in common are continually colonized as free resources for capital. Yet, as Feroz Manji highlighted, drawing on the example of the ongoing movement for housing across South Africa, there are many movements in multiple locations which are organizing politically and creatively, rejecting the violent logic of the market and the racialized binary of the deserving and undeserving, and building what Keston Perry calls reparative ecology. Spanner spoke of the need to build and rebuild solidarities across geographies between the initiatives for mutual aid and the struggles for justice of the marginalized, engaged in changing the conditions of their own lives, and ultimately to think about not only alternatives to development, but alternatives to capitalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalpana, for that incredibly rich reflection on your roundtable that you organized as well as chaired. 
Um, I think similarly to Jenna and, and, and Kamna, um, takeaways from that particular reflection, just pulling out some, some phrases that you mentioned, you know, the, the whole idea of, of centering race and racism when we're thinking about talking about theorizing about development is about challenging not only extraction, but also dispossession. Thinking about the materiality of, of race and racism and development as well, beyond the discourse, because I think we've done a really good job in, in the sector and in the discipline about thinking about race and racism within the context of, of, of development discourse, but not sufficiently talked about the materiality of race and racism. And I think you do that beautifully in your book. Um, Want to plug your book again for those who have, haven't read it. Um, and then about the unequal power relationships, right? The, the unequal economic relationships that development deploys um, when we're thinking about the so-called global South and the so-called global North. And then last but certainly not least, the importance of centering history. I mean, we, we sort of take this for granted, but um, if you take out colonialism, if you take out imperialism and this sort of 21st century manifestations, neoliberalism, without thinking about those issues and those processes, then we're really missing a big, piece of the pie, a big, a big piece of the, the puzzle. Um, so I think there, there's a scholar by the name of Brodkin, you've probably come across, who talks about race as a relationship to the means of production. And I think that's such a really great way of looking at um, the relationship between race and, and capital, um, which scholars like Walter Rodney and, and um, Robinson have done in the past. I think one of the other things that I thought was really important in terms of your reflection and the discussion is that capital is always extractive in the same way that aid is always extractive. So we need to move beyond these discussions of aid into a real discussion about um, reparations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kapana. We'll come back to some of these issues, I'm sure, um, during the, the, the communal discussion. So roundtable three in our series was titled Race, Racism and the Everyday in Development. It was chaired by Althea Maria Rivas, who is a lecturer in development studies at SOAS, University of London. Althea is author of the 2020 book, Security, Development and Violence in Afghanistan, Everyday Stories of Intervention, another book that you have to go and buy um, or download as soon as possible. So Althea, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your reflections from the round table that you organized and shared, any salient points that came up during that discussion. Great, thanks Robta. Um, so ours was the third round table and we focused on unraveling some silences as we've all talked about silences um, about the often violent entanglements of race, racism and development which occur at the everyday level. And we enjoyed interventions and reflections by Professor Adia Benton who's an associate professor in anthropology at Northwestern University. Uh, Everjoyce Wynn, who's a, a practitioner with decades of experience in over 27 countries, um, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And she's also currently a professor of practice at SOAS University um, in the Center for Carmen, uh, Dr. Carmen Leon Hamilton, who's a senior researcher at the Overseas um, Development Institute, and Professor Daniel Bendix. Can you hear me? And Professor Daniel Bendix, okay, who's an associate professor um, at Friedensau Adventist University. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that first word there. Um, and also a very engaged audience. So yesterday in my reflections on the round table, uh, you know, I thought definitely about the speakers' comments and interventions, but also about the comments and discussion uh, that were taking place in the chat because there was quite a vigorous kind of, um, back and forth going on there as well amongst the audience members and sometimes between the audience members and the speakers. began from Gloria Vecker, uh, who says that the point of not knowing of racial ignorance and of white innocence has long passed. And this set the tone for a discussion which focused not on questioning whether race and racism is an issue in everyday development spaces and practice, but a discussion which delved deeper into how the colonial history and legacy upon which international development discourse and practice is built continues to produce racialized spaces and to reinforce asymmetrical power relations in new and complex ways through everyday encounters. Uh, there were many issues that came up yesterday, but I've chosen three um, of the key ideas or themes to speak of, and then I hopefully you know, we'll be able to bring up some more during the discussion um, of the plenary. So those three themes are everyday violence and resistance um, in a different way that we use, usually think about it, a development research and race, racialized uh, realities and intersectionality. So the first 
and resist. So the panel spoke a lot about the irony of the multiple explicit and direct ways in which development practice devalues the lives of people that it claims to be trying to empower on an everyday level, right? So numerous examples were given by Ever Joyce who drew upon decades of experience working in the development and humanitarian sector of the ways in which everyday interactions in the development sector around things like contracting practices, programs, Conditions, procedures, recruitment practices, and recruitment practices reproduce and reinforce racialized hierarchies. Okay. So even, for example, the focus on equitable partnerships, okay, or better partnerships, doesn't contest the pervasive whiteness um, and practices of extraction and exclusion embedded in development. Uh, Professor Adia Benton spoke of the way that localization is therefore often attached to withdrawal or defunding and increases in insecurity and how policies and remuneration schemes often shift um, depending on or when the number of black and brown staff members within an organization increases in a way which devalues their, their lives, their work and their knowledge. Secondly, uh, we spoke about the racialized structures and in development studies and racialized realities and Carmen um, and Daniel spoke and articulated the problematic uh, nature of research practices, but also the experience of racialized uh, researchers and students in development studies departments and institutions. The highlight of privilege within the academy and research institutions often reveal deep assumptions about who produces knowledge and the positionality of racialized scholars and students. Right? So for researchers in particular, whose identity places them at the periphery of dominant knowledge paradigms of many Western universities that are embedded, of course, in patriarchy and Eurocentrism, this creates frustration and anxiety. So the researcher may acknowledge the privilege they have when it, um, from coming that they, that they have by coming from of Global North Research Institution or University. But at the same time, they find that they're unable to see themselves or find themselves in conversations that take place at the, within those institutions and universities about um, positionality, about research ethics, right? About relationships with um, the Global South or those communities over there, right? Adia highlighted that racialized and gender and history, the research process and the experience of the researcher and the perceptions of research participants and communities of the researcher um, when, a, when that researcher themselves come from a racialized community in ways that we don't talk about um, enough within research circles and academia. So the whiteness, therefore, of development studies, academic spaces, means that issues of race and racism within our own institutions and research practice are rarely centered in a self-reflective way. And discussions of race, if they happen at all, are often met with great hostility or a need to cater for white fragility. The um, panel yesterday and from the chat, um, so that the feedback from the audience, that the academy needs to rethink the boundaries of these conversations that we have about research, about research identity and take into consideration the diverse subjectivities of uh, scholars themselves and make space for um, scholars of racialized backgrounds to have conversations amongst themselves about these things as well. And then lastly, um, intersectionality and positionality. Positionality, of course, of first um, is related to what I've just said about academic spaces. But also um, intersectionality was really central to the discussion yesterday. And the, the panel ended with an important Louise Webb yesterday, but was also a panelist on the first round table, which took place on Monday about racialized ways of knowing. And Louise highlighted the importance of discussing not only race, but the intersections of injustice, um, the multiple injustices that take place in relation to development. And this is something that I think Kalpana and um, Kamina and Jenna have all kind of spoken about in different ways. Okay. So Adia pointed out that as we know, race is always sexed, it's classed, it's gendered, and it intersects with multiple other subjectivities and locations. Um, and in many ways, her comments spoke to the reflections from the panel on the realities of scholars of color and practitioners of color working in and researching the development sector. The panelists highlighted the need to recognize how things such as his acts and access to resources and development are closely tied to racialized and gendered inequalities, which reveal the presence of colonial legacies in development. 
They also stress the nature and importance of understanding the ways in which power circulates through the structures of aid and reproduces intersectional inequalities and influences relationships between people from the global south and local communities and people of color who work for development agencies um, and in development research. The comments from the panel spoke to the need to acknowledge how an intersectional lens in many ways can allow us to destabilize essentialist notions of privilege and oppression. Better grasp takes place under its basis, reinforcing inequalities and interacts with different temporalities, subjectivities, diverse histories and localized meanings in different parts of the world and, and how that changes as people move through different parts of the world. Okay, so whereas it's not just a conversation about um, diaspora communities as well, it's much more complex than that. And I think that was a, an important point that came out yesterday. At the same time, however, it was also highlighted that we need to be careful about um, discussions around intersectionality, the experiences of racialized aid workers and positionality, and make sure that these subjectivities are not used to deflect from discussions about white supremacy and development practice and research, or as a means to not address one's complicity um, and role in the maintenance of the racialized inequalities uh, in development studies and the development sector and racism. And I think lastly, one thing that, um, that came out through all of the themes and I think has also been mentioned by um, Kamana, uh, Jenna and, Patel, and um, uh, Kalpana is that despite the very clear, persistent, regularized, racialized violences that take place in the development sector, so the, the panel also highlighted the ever-present resistance in the development sector and in the academy um, to acknowledge the racialized nature of their everyday practices. So even now, while there's a global conversation on racial inequality that's been ignited by Black Lives Matter, um, in a way in which perhaps there is more acknowledgement of the colonial and racialized history, history of development, okay, there's still a real resistance and even refusal and perhaps backlash, um, I think is one of the terms that was used in the, in the chat, to understand how that racialized history is it's today, how it's used to really structure our um, interactions with each other, not just in the sector, but also within the academy, right? Um, and it's, it's part of our everyday realities. Uh, and there's a lack of willingness to acknowledge the ways in which people are actively involved in maintaining those structures of inequality on multiple levels. So I think, um, yeah, our round table, it gave us a really good understanding of the, the ways in which power and privilege kind of function within development agencies, but also other spaces like the academy, research organization, and think tanks. Okay. And I guess I'll end it there. Yes. Thank you so much, Althea, for that incredibly rich um, summary <laughs> of your of your particular roundtable. It's funny I was I was following the the chat <laughs> during your roundtable, and I think we had enough material to actually write several books from just the chat. And I think uh, Jenna may have saved the chat, so we've got quite a bit of material to to, to work with. Um, but in terms of the salient points, I just want to you know just recap the violent entanglements of race and racism within the context of development, not only uh, the physical violence of, of race and racism, but also the structural violence of race and racism and the everyday practices of violence within the sector, within the field. Um, you also talked about the importance of centering not only intersectionality and the positionality of different people in, in these fields as it relates to you know, their, their qualifiers such as race, their gender, socioeconomic status, so forth and so on. Um, but also thinking about knowledge production and the, ep the ep epistemic violence of knowledge production as it relates to race and racism within the field. Um, I think one of the things that I remember one of the panelists saying is, is, is thinking about um, how development is the institutionalization of difference. I thought that was such a beautiful way of put it. I think it was Adia Benson who said that. Um, and then people also brought to the fore the intra-racial hierarchies within development, particularly in the so-called global South. And I think EJ Everjoyce Wynn talked about the localization as a performance, right? So local actors tend to have to jump through all of these hoops to be able to be in positions of power in their countries of origin. But that also comes with defunding, 
and what are the implications of that as well. So thank you very, very much, um, Althea, for that summary. I Before I bring Amanda into the discussion, because I think it's so uh, fitting to bring her into the discussion now that we're having conversations about racism and race in the everyday and development, um, the chat is, is quite quiet. <laughs> So I want I want to encourage people again, if you have any sort of interjection, any reflection, any resistance to what we're saying, please, please, please pose your question, your comment in the chat, the Zoom, the Zoom chat function. I will acknowledge people who raise their hand um, a bit early if you want to verbalize your, your comment. But I'd like to see the chat, the chat going strong. Um, and, I'll, and I'll pull some of those questions and comments throughout the discussion a bit later. So Amanda, we're going to bring you into the discussion because I said it's, it's such a great segue leaving from um, Althea's reflection specifically about Roundtable 3 on race and racism mm -hmm. in the everyday and development. Mm -hmm. um, now, for people who are not familiar with Amanda, Amanda Kozi Mukwashi is the CEO of Christian Aid. Her career spans intergovernmental and non-governmental spaces, including the United Nations, BSO International, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa and Zambia. She is the author of the 2020 book, which I love, but where are you really from? <laughs> and I think that's a question that many of us get asked to much annoyance. Um, so I think it was great that you were able to vocalize that in a book title. Um, we invite Amanda now at this point to not only reflect on what's been said already, but specifically to reflect on how she engages issues of race and racism in her work as a development practitioner. Amanda, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I, I do hope that um, when, I, when I finish speaking that you will feel like you can invite me again um, uh, to, to, your, to your conference. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, a former colleague, a, a colleague of mine uh, has always said, uh, I'm sure you know Tina Wallace, she's always said, you should come and attend, you should come and attend. And well, I'm here. Um, it was fascinating. Uh, I always find it very fascinating to come into a group of uh, academics um, as they speak on issues of, of any, on any issue. Yesterday, I was talking to students at Warwick University and, um, and it's, I'm always amazed at just how much of the language that is used is actually very exclusive and um, and and that's that's my starting point right so um so I've, i was thinking about you know how am i going to sort of reflect on some of the things that i've heard but also from my own experience and um there are three things that i'm probably going to talk about i've tried to structure them um despite the fact that um i usually prefer to speak more randomly um as, uh, as things emerge from, uh, from my mind and from my lived experience. So I will say something about race uh, in the sector, in development. I will talk a little bit about the Christian aid journey. And I also want to be able to talk about myself and my own experience within this. But before I do that, what I found interesting uh, was the, the question itself. Um, when I looked at the question of what is so unsettling, uh, one of the things that I, I thought was, um, who is asking this question and to whom is the question being asked? Right. What, what is so unsettling what, about race? Right. Um, and um, the reason why I was wondering who is being asked this question is because when I think of the history of Black people, we have been unsettled for many generations. So the question cannot be asked to us because we are unsettled. Uh, we've been unsettled um, for quite a long time, right? Um, we, we, are un we continue to be unsettled. When the race report comes out in the UK, and says there's no institutional racism, when we see the statistics telling us differently in terms of employment, in terms of health, in terms of housing, in terms of those that get um, discriminated in terms of education, um, right across the board, when we look at COVID numbers and uh, black and brown people are more likely to die um, as a result of, of COVID because of their socioeconomic status. We've been unsettled for a very long time. So who is asking the question 
and to whom? Who should be, uh, you know, what is so unsettling for who, I guess, is, um, is one of the things that I wanted to pose as, as an introduction to, I think, my approach um, when I come to this. Um, and I would probably suggest that uh, when we ask the question, what is so unsettling, um, we are actually talking about systems. So whether it's social systems, whether it's economic systems, whether it's political systems uh, that have, are in place um, that create that um, continued benefit and dominance of uh, white colleagues uh, over those that are black and brown and people of color or what's, whatever terminology you're more comfortable with as individuals, right? So when we look at the economic systems, the economic structures, let's take the issue of, um, uh, let's take the current issues. Let's talk about current issues. So when you talk about an issue of vaccine, we are all talking about vaccine in uh, apartheid, vaccine in, in inequity. Um, what, what do we actually see? What is behind that? Let's really look at what is behind that, right? So the vaccines have been produced, right? Uh, the poorest countries where mainly it's people of color who live there, right? will have to borrow money by and large to be able to buy uh, the vaccine. Yes, there is the global narrative that we have COVAX and in COVAX we're going to donate uh, and so much. Two, um, when are those vaccines going to be available? They're not going to be available immediately. Why? Because first we must take care of those who are on a slightly higher, more privileged, right, um, platform uh, than, um, than the others. And so uh, the fact that these countries are going to maybe not even get vaccines this year, uh, maybe it will be next year, who knows? Maybe it will be the year after that, right? But that is not just an one issue, it's a systemic issue because when we look at issues of debt, for example, right? What do we see? Yet again, you look at an economic system uh, that uh, has created a business model because that's what it is. It's a business model um, that benefits on the exploitation of, uh, in this case, people of color or nations of color, right? Um, to feed the consumption habits um, of, uh, of those in wealthier nations. And even when you go into the wealthier nations, so if you come into the UK, if you go to the US, and then you look at the hierarchy, right? You find it's exactly the same hierarchy with the bottom of the hierarchy, the system uh, in terms of people of color, which, um, which is very interesting in terms of, um, uh, I think there was something, uh, I think one of you, I can't remember who talked about capitalism, right? And, um, and when you look at all this, when you look at historically, whether it's colonialism, whether it's slave trade, it's all a form of capitalism, right? It's all a, a, a social economic system, right? That trades um, on people's identity, people's knowledge and people's culture, right? So when you have robbed people of their identity, when you have robbed them of, um, of their knowledge, uh, and their culture, uh, and then you create a benchmark, a standard that is um, all about whiteness, right? Um, and that's the standard that we are working towards, right? Uh, in all areas, and I'll come to a bit of more detail on that, then, uh, then actually you've created a whole system, right? Where we will never be good enough, right? It's, a, it's like a bicycle, you've got two wheels and the back wheel is forever chasing the, the, the front wheel, the front tire, uh, there'll, there'll never be a catch up. So um, I think that's, that's my context. So when we're talking about what's so unsettling, I think what's so unsettling is the dismantling of these systems, right? The recognition by um, white, um, a white system, and I'm going to call it a white system, right? 
the recognition of a white system and white colleagues that actually for this to be dismantled and for this to be changed, I'm going to lose power. I'm going to lose uh, generations of, uh, of my lifestyle. Things that I think my parents and my grandparents and uh, our ancestors have worked for, right? Worked for, right? That is what is most dis dis um, unsettling because it is going to the very heart and foundation of the current power systems and power structures. And uh, perhaps just to say uh, that um, what is in addition to that, in terms of what is so unsettling, is uh, the reality that capitalism, no matter how glorified it is as a system, it has failed and it shall not deliver for the world's majority, you know, majority, not in its current form. Because in its current form, it's a free market system that thrives on already existing fault lines of oppression, of identity, of knowledge, and, and all those other things that I think you've spoke about much better than I can. And so let me go, um, come sort of narrow down a little bit into the sector that, that I work in. And um, I, I think sometimes when we think of our sector, we might be in danger of thinking of our se sector as existing outside the context that I've just described. And yet we are not outside of that context. Um, and we're not just inside that context. We are founded on that foundation. We are founded on that particular um, set of principles and rules. And um, even for, for, for somebody like me who works for a faith-based organization, I would like to remind everyone that actually faith, religion was at the dawn of, uh, of the creation of, um, of, of racialized uh, society, right? Um, that it's part and parcel of uh, the, the definition of uh, humans and subhumans, okay? It was when uh, religious, organized religion agreed and said, yes, when you look at, for example, the African person, they're not quite as human and therefore you can trade them on the marketplace, right? So I'm not going to, I'm not here to apologize for, organized religion, but I'm also not an ostrich. I see it for what it is. And then I want to talk to you and share with you uh, what, as, you know, as Christian Aid, how our pathway goes through this. And hopefully at the end, I can also speak more freely about why I still remain a person of faith, regardless of what I have, uh, what I have, uh, what I have seen. And so um, develop international development uh, NGOs, uh, exist within this framework. And um, it would be disingenuous to, for anybody who works in the sector to think in any way, form or shape that we are therefore immune um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the processes, the powers, the, the benefits uh, of, of the system that I've described. And so let me zero in uh, even a bit deeper. If you take, for example, the example of our funding models, right? I think uh, in one of the groups you said you have Eva Joyce uh, Wayne was sitting in there and she probably already spoke to this. But if you look at the funding models, uh, traditional funding models within the sector um, go like this. So you have institutional um, um, funders that will give you money from donor countries. And that money, will fund projects or programs and the security of tenure of office of members of staff at country level. So when I say at country level, I mean in program countries is always limited. They are never quite safe or guaranteed that you know, uh, they will have a permanent job, right? And yet, all if maybe most, if not all the roles that are based in the donor countries in the United Kingdom 
in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in the US, those who have security of tenure of office. They will have the permanent contracts uh, or long-term contracts, they're safe, okay? What does that, actually, that model do, considering that where we want development to take place is in the, those countries where actually people are always having to look for the next job because they know that their contract is coming to an end, okay? That system is a system that um, actually goes contradictory to what we're trying to do as international NGOs in terms of development, in terms of building resilience, in terms of building capacities. Yes, even the word localization, and I know that in Christian aid, we work very much on localization, but even that term localization is problematic, right? You cannot localize that which is already local, right? Um, who are we or who are you or who am I to go to Zimbabwe or to go to Malawi to try and localize when actually they are already local, right? Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll be, I'll be very quick. Um, the, I think that um, one of the things that I've been struggling with uh, in our sector is um, that because uh, the definition of development itself, right? Um, it, it starts off with the, who, who is developed? Because when you're saying these are developing countries and these are developed countries, um, who is developed? So who defined what developed looks, looks like, right? And it's all very much a Western model of, of development. It's a bit like when we talk about theology, we talk about Western theology. And we understand and unpack and interrogate Western theology for what it is, because embedded within it are imperialist tendencies, right, uh, within that. It's the same with development. You know, um, it's defined in a particular, uh, from a particular standpoint. And so when we say we are working in development, when we go to design programs and projects, who are we using as our standard? We're using this Western model that we are saying this is what good looks like. And therefore, when we're building resilience, we want you to be like them. This is where we want you to go. This is what we need you to do, right? And, I, and that system, that system needs to be stopped. And that is unsettling for all of us because, and here I'm going now to come to myself, um, uh, please just put your hand up if you think I've run out of time. Um, but I just want to come to myself, to you know, to myself. And then, if you want me to answer questions, I'm happy to give uh, more thoughts. Um, Amanda, you're getting a lot of preach, preach, preach in the chat. So I'll give you a couple more minutes, and then we're going to bring you back in because people are feeling everything you're saying. Okay, thanks. So um, the so just before I jump into into myself. You know, when I joined Christian Aid as CEO, um, uh, I, I've been working in this sector for quite a long time. I, I think I'm going to close to 30 years in this sector, right? And, um, and you see the hierarchy of, of race in development, right? Um, you see it as in Latin America, Central America, Asia, and, uh, and Africa, uh, and the Caribbean and Africa, right? And when you really interrogate it, what you see is the, the colors moving from lighter to darker, okay? And, um, and so when we, when we think of, uh, um, let's say officers, right? Uh, those who, have, who are respected more, um, you will start with Latin America, because you know what? We can, we can um, uh, relate to uh, colleagues from Latin America, they look like us. Some of them, or the majority, they look like us. That's what we are hardwired to be thinking. Those are the background conversations that are happening within us. Whether we recognize or not, whether intentional or unintentional, those are the background conversations that are taking place, okay? And so the further away uh, the person looks from us, uh, the more we cannot really trust them. And that's why personally I put, I wrote my book because it's really on identity and humanhood, okay? Um, and so 
within Christian Aid, we've gone through quite a journey and um, uh, I don't have time to go through all of that. But um, what has kept my hope uh, strong is because uh, we had candid conversations. We invited, we did not define anything from the word go. What we said was, we are going to tackle the issue of race. There were people in the organization who said, well, let's not just look at race. Let's look at the different intersectionalities. Let's look at different areas of inclusion. I said, no, because each time we list the different things of inclusion, areas of inclusion, race, the skin color issue always goes to the bottom and nobody ever deals with it. So that's what we're going to focus on. And we invited people to give us their lived experiences. And it was not a pretty read, okay? It was a tough one, especially for an organization that's a faith-based organization. We pride ourselves in our values of dignity, of love, of justice, of equality, right? But because it came bottom up, right? What we are able to do now is regardless of, of, of the color of your skin, we're able to sit in one room and have the type of conversation that I'm having with you, you know? And, and people feel um, they have the permission to say, this is tough, but I want to talk about it, okay? Um, and so uh, I think for me, my experience uh, as a CEO of one of the bigger, biggest um, uh, UK international NGOs is varied. Somebody talked about silence. The first group, you talked about silence. Um, and I have said to colleagues in the sector, other CEOs, your silence is not for me. Your silence is to protect yourself. It's to safeguard what you have, right? So when you remain silent, when you see me being racially discriminated against, no matter how subtle, but you can see it, right? Your silence, please don't apologize and say, sorry, I didn't say anything I should have because your silence is to protect yourself, to keep the status quo. Now, of course, that's a hard line because I'm sure that um, sometimes it's just that people are like a rabbit in front of uh, um, lights and you really don't know how to deal with it. So let's, let's, let's have a conversation. So what I want to leave you with is this, that, um, it is to answer the question, what is so unsettling is please understand this. For many, many, the majority of black and brown people, we have been as unsettled for a long time. We are not comfortable when uh, our brothers and sons are being killed and knifed and nobody says anything. When the race report comes out and there's no outcry of outrage from the mainstream, we are unsettled. We have been unsettled for many, many centuries, right? Uh, so what is so unsettling, unsettling about race and development is that it is for the first time, I think, at least in our generation, uh, it is naming it and it is unsettling the mainstream. And I think that's a good place for us to start the conversation. Thank you very much. And I will now just hand back over to you, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I have to repeat everybody's preach, 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 Amanda. That was um, such powerful words um, on a multiplicity of different issues from COVID-19, you think about the inability of so-called global North countries to allow IP waivers, <laughs> intellectual property waivers to enable countries in the so-called global South to produce vaccines for themselves. Um, you think about the hierarchies of development as proximity to whiteness. <laughs> So the closer you are to whiteness, the more so-called developed you are and that violence of, of language. Um, you also talked about the complicity of organized religion in entrancing race and racism within the, the development sector. And I think that candidness, that honesty is something that's being appreciated throughout the chat. Um, people are you know, praising you for that. Um, and then, you know, it's a question that I'm gonna throw back to my sister colleagues on this panel, you know, the exclusivity of the language of, of, of academia, how it obscures more than it reveals. There's a scholar by the name of Tejumola um, Oyewole, who's based, I think, with the African um, Language Association. And Tejumola talks about the idea of us trying to, striving to be interstitial scholars. 
And interstitial scholarship is really about being able to speak in multiple different languages. So the language of academia, but to also speak about these issues such that they are accessible to a broad range of people. Um, so maybe we can talk about that, the, the violence of language of, of academia and how this language could be considered racist in, in many respects. Um, you also talked about the fact that free market capitalism as, as a foundation for race and capital will never, never be emancipatory. So we have to think about completely dismantling the system of capitalism and coming up with a different form of, of social reproduction. So those are some of the issues that I pulled up. There were, there were very, very many more, um, but maybe, maybe Kapana, Kamna, and Althea maybe can speak to the issue of language because she started us off with that. Um, and even started thinking about unsettling. What does this mean to be unsettled? <laughs> Who is unsettled and for what reason? Um, and it, as she was talking about the whole notion of unsettlement, I, I was thinking about um, James Baldwin's notion when he left the United States and went into exile in France, he said, to be a black person in the United States is to be in a permanent state of rage. To be a black or brown person in the context of development is probably to be in a permanent state of unsettlement. <laughs> So maybe we'll start with that, the language, but then also thinking about this idea of unsettling. Who's unsettling what? Anyone can jump in. Uh, maybe I can start. So Amanda, thank you so much for being able to join us and for those provocations, but they're more than provocations. You're laying down a gauntlet for, for everyone that's on this call and everyone who's gonna be watching it hereafter. I want to reflect, Rob, tell on what you said about the violence of language and regarding it as a violence. And there are two things that I'd like to say in this regard that are somewhat related. And the first came up in our panel about the power of the Anglosphere within development. And so this is not just an academic language, this is also an issue of English and the dominance that English has within the development sector. Now, of course, this is absolutely tied to um, colonial legacies. And so, I'm, you know, I, I'm delighted that ODS are going to be publishing in Spanish, but let's not forget that is also a colonial language. So, you know, diversity of sorts might not actually get us to this point of deracializing our engagements and the registers within which we speak to each other. And so I'm conscious and mindful here that whilst I'm talking to you about my comments, if I suddenly switched, very few. So, this proximity to whiteness too in the aid system. And I'm reminded of something that a dear friend of mine who works for Save the Children said, that why is it and how is it and where is it? But once somebody starts working in the development sector, their success is hitched onto either working in a head office somewhere in a European office and then eventually moving to Washington or New York. So how is it that these geographical movements that are also linguistically tied become markers of success in the sector? And one more thought specifically, if I may, about our use of academic language. And I don't say this as an excuse, I say this as a way to shed light on something that might otherwise go under remarked. The fact that we are all women of color in the academy and the ways in which we utilize the language that is available to us is also our expression of power and our expression of speaking back to a system that thinks of us as less than. And so there is something that comes from speaking the language of the oppressor, speaking in a way on equal terms, but in our own way at the same time. I'll pause my comments. I think you've just answered uh, that question of can the subaltern speak? Yes, she can in multiple languages. <laughs> Anyone else want to come in, Kapana or Althea Maria? Um, maybe I'll just, can you hear me? Sorry, my connection has been a bit unstable the last few days, so I'm just checking. But um, not so much on the point of language, but I think on what is unsettling about development. One of the things that came up in the panel and that you know I've been reflecting on a lot is the, the importance of kind of um, highlighting that, you know, development, it's not just the persistent, like marginalized as well, thing of life, like the, the constant and regular and normalized practice, normalized way of devaluing people's lives. And, you know, Amanda mentioned, this, you know, the, the way racialization really was a, a system which 
divided kind of the humans and the subhumans. And I think it's important to recognize how that kind of devaluation that like of, of a dehumanization is still really present in development, right? And it's, it's violent and to not, and to use words that are strong enough to help us understand like how um, explicit and destructive these practices are, right? And how pervasive. Thank you, Althea. Um, you know, I, you, oh, sorry, sorry, Althea, continue. Did I cut, uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're kind of in and out, but we can hear the gist of what you're saying. Yeah, so the international art, uh, aid architecture is it's fundamentally dependent upon white supremacy, right? And therefore like racist behavior and practices kind of, they have to go unchecked because um, they're necessary to fuel that project, right? Because it's life force is dependent upon the idea that certain things like capacity, resources, knowledge is linked to whiteness, right? So while somebody might intellectually understand that racism is bad right, um, in terms of conversations, the destabilization of white supremacy is perhaps more unimaginably worse, right? So we have to kind of remember that white privilege is dependent upon black and brown suffering. And so a system that is dependent upon white supremacy must reproduce um, you know, systems, practices, engagements that then uh, um, that black and dependent upon it. Right? It cannot exist without it. And so there shouldn't be shock at this, um, but we do need to center it. And that's why there's so much resistance. And in terms of language, just quickly, I worked in the development sector for like 12 years before doing my PhD. And I have to say that within development, there is a very specific language as well. Like the number of acronyms that development agencies use is ridiculous. So I think depending on the space that you're in, you use it. Sometimes that language is complex. Yeah, I think jargon yeah. is one that's universal throughout all the different sectors and disciplines. Um, Kapana, please. Yeah, can I just quickly, sorry, can I just, before Kapanam comes in, can I just- Sure, Amanda, um, go ahead. I, I, I think it's true that uh, there's jargon in every sector, right? And um, I know this uh, personally because I know that my team are always trying to get me to use the words that are, you know, that people will recognize. Um, and I also know of my own struggle because I have tried very much to keep to my normal what I call normal ordinary language when I'm talking about things. Speaking um, uh, naturally. Um, I remember when, uh, when I wrote the book, um, But Where Are You Ready From? Uh, there was somebody who said to me, maybe you should try and make it a little bit more academic or a little bit more developmental. And I said, that, well, that's not me, okay? That, that, that's not me. And I think that, I, I think language is a double-edged sword, and I think it's really important to understand that, right? Um, I come from, from Zambia, a country where we have over 72 ethnic groups who speak different languages. We communicate in English. It has robbed us of, uh, of our essence, of you know something that is much deeper, um, because English words do not capture uh, the heart of what I'm trying to say. I'm having to, right now, I'm having to think in my language, translate from there and be able to communicate um, with everybody. And yes, that can be looked as, as a power. And I think it, it can be like uh, Kamna described, uh, but at the very heart of it, right? Uh, ask yourself, what is the background conversation that's taking place in your mind that means that it's so easy for us to go into jargon and use jargon? Because actually it's about power, it's about exclusion. You know, who are we excluding when we use jargon in development or when we use jargon in academia or when we use jargon elsewhere? We are excluding others and making ourselves feel special. We are feeding our ego as a sector, right? Kapana. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with with um, everything that's been said already on this, particularly, you know, around the violence of language. And I think um, part of it is, of course, the the fact that uh, having the job and having the, the language is related to construction of experts and who can be an expert and who can't. And I think, as we've heard, it, that itself is so deeply racialized. 
Um, but I think I also wanted to think about the fact that there has been a kind of moving into academia of um, anti-racist struggle and a kind of um, academization of it, which you know perhaps began in the US, but is also really, really happening here. And maybe that's something that we need to to question a little bit. You know, while it's it's really important that these these conversations are happening in academia. Sometimes it's really important to remember that there's a whole world out there of, of struggles, of movements, um, which, you know, in a way, you know, the danger of actually ending up marginalizing those in having these conversations, which, which we're having. So, I mean, yeah, and, and, and the same goals for development, of course. I mean, um, I think, you know, people have talked about intersectionality and that's, of course, it's, 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 been a very useful term, but it's also been used to depoliticize. It's also, I mean, we know that it's something uh, which ex existed as a way of thinking about race and gender long, long before even Kimberly Crenshaw's, you know, rightfully very influential piece, right? It goes back to, you know, it goes back to Sojourner Truth in the 19th century, right? It goes back to the very roots of Black feminism and Black feminist thinking. Um, and what development has done is make it into a toolkit, right, which is like got a whole series of different, um, you know, uh, things that you input into it and then you get out something and then you can show your, your funders that you've, you've done that. So I think that's the kind of process which happens with so many uh, political ideas, radical ideas for, for social transformation. Um, and the other thing I just very briefly wanted to touch on was this whole question about hierarchy um, and, and proximity to whiteness. I think um, it's very important to remember that this was always a colonial strategy, it, you know, a, about creating racial hierarchies and using certain groups against others, whether it's in particular contexts or particular our countries, particular histories, or whether it's globally. And as someone who works on India, you know, I, I do get asked about the fact, well, doesn't it make a difference that we now have Indian billionaires who are part of the, you know, who are part of the global capitalist um, establishment? And of course, on one level, it does. It matters because those people are extremely powerful. For ordinary people in India, for Dalits, Adivasis, for you know, the millions of people being dispossessed by corporate capital, no, they, it, it doesn't make a difference to them whether they're experiencing that from an Indian multinational or from a British or, or European or American uh, multinational. Um, and we also have to think about the ideology which promotes those, those, um, those capitalists within India, which is at present uh, uh, a, you know, a Hindu supremacist one, which which actively kind of um, promotes the sort of entrenched anti-blackness, which I think it's really important that um, South Asian activists are talking about now in the context of Black Lives Matter. Um, it, it actively promotes uh, caste hierarchies and caste supremacy. It actively promotes uh, Islamophobia. So we need to think about uh, you know, coming back to this whole idea of what are the states we're talking about in the global south? Who, who do they represent? Thank you so much for your comments, um, Kapana, Kamna, and Althea. And then Amanda comes back into the conversation as well in in uh, uh, reflections about language. I want to switch gears slightly because I think one of the one of the powerful constructs of this roundtable series that we that we held a really great plug for us as a working group <laughs> but i think importantly is that we were able to draw in scholars academics practitioners activists people like amanda in conversation about the state of affairs of development right and they came from multiple multiple different disciplines so is is there value in being inter in, in being indisciplined <laughs> in our interdisciplinarity, in our multidisciplinarity, what value do we get from people who are speaking across disciplines um, as development scholars specifically? Um, so I, I, if, if you can reflect on that, especially as it relates to the people we were in conversation with during the roundtable sessions, and then more broadly, where do we go from here in terms of that indiscipline in our interdisciplinarity? <laughs> 
and anyone can jump in. Okay, I guess if if nobody else wants to speak, I'll just um, quickly say, I think for me, development studies has always been um, an interdisciplinary field, right? So we've always had scholars uh, coming from different places, you know, geography, international relations, um, anthropology, a lot of anthropologists like historically have, you know, worked in development studies. And I think some disciplines more so than others um, have engaged with issues around power. I mean, so we can learn from each other, like radical geography, for example, black geography, um, and other disciplines have done less so. So that interdisciplinary kind of nature of development studies, I think helps us learn from each other in terms of kind of the practice and the questions that we're engaging with. And also because it is a, you know, an interdisciplinary discipline that is closely related to a field of practice, right? So that engagement back and forth with policymakers, with practitioners also helps us understand kind of the realities of, of certain groups of people who are engaged in the, the everyday kind of development practice. And that's kind of, you know, what the third panel spoke to. It's like how we understand how these academic discourses are actually very um, real realities and, and, and um, translate to material conditions. Shall I jump in? Yes, please do, Amanda. Um, so the, I, I think in, maybe in answer to your question, I was just thinking that for me as a, as a practitioner, um, when I, when I visit a, women in Ethiopia or in Malawi or in Bolivia or in Colombia, right, human rights defenders, um, what I see is, um, uh, is that I cannot actually come to that conversation from one discipline because when i'm sitting with them as human rights defenders they are telling me about their experience as women they are also talking about their experience as uh, people who've been dispos dispossessed of their land they're also talking about people who've experienced physical violence they're also talking so all the different um uh, sort of uh, what i would call disciplines um for them, for that one person, right, everything hits them in one go. So it might be comfortable for us and it's more organized for us to really be focused on our specific disciplines. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as a criticism at all, please. I'm just saying it as a fact that it, it helps us. So I studied international economic law. I want to see things from that perspective, but actually, you know, climate change, COVID, debt, um, health access, whatever, it's all in this one person, right? So um, what I found has been very helpful has been to get myself out of the box of my discipline um, uh, and think across um, uh, into uh, what I see as, uh, if I can borrow the word unsettling, into a world where I'm actually not as much in control because that's what it is. You're not, uh, the rules of, uh, of this is how research is done. The rules of uh, it works in this way. It's a linear process. It's a matrix. It, uh, it just doesn't fit in any one box, right? And I am, I am unsettled with that because I am hardwired. I've, all my training, you know, when I was at law school, all my training throughout my career has been to think in particular frameworks and narratives and theories and hypotheticals, right? But when I go to meet all these people, they throw all that out of the box. And so there is, I think that it's not either or, I think there's enough space for both of those things to exist. But I think that we need some kind of, uh, we need to get comfortable, we need to get settled with the, an, an, we need to get settled with an unsettled reality. Right, um, and and know that uh, therefore we are not coming with any kind of solutions. Right, it's uh, it's always um, uh, a process of learning, and this is my particular hobby horse actually. That um, uh, I read I read books, okay, because I I feel like I have to read books, um, and and. Um, I, I, I read research I, because I need to read that for my job. But if you ask me, if you really ask me, Amanda, what do you prefer? I would have told you that what I prefer 
is the oral stories that mm -hmm. I'm told that come with the emotion, with facts, with the lived experiences. And I don't need to translate those into writing for somebody else, right? Um, I want to value them for what they are, but actually our world has devalued that. And so even when you talk about a story, right? Um, it's almost like, it's not quite the same as, you know, as an academic piece of work, because this is just one story, right? So we have, what we've done is we've put one system against another system and fitted them against each other, rather than to just think this is one system, this is another system, and they coexist, right? And they actually are interdependent, they feed into, each, into one another, and, uh, and somehow we navigate that space. I didn't answer your question, but... No, That's thank you, Amanda. I mean, I, th I think you brought up a really important point about valuing different knowledge registers, um, that it's not just because the written word is also violent. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about that as well. It's a long conversation that scholars have had and are continuing to have. Um, Kamna, did you want to come in? I, I wanted to open it up and say to people that I see that there are lots of comments being generated in the chat, so I won't go over those because I think they're important for them to just happen and exist in the chat function. But if you do have a question that you would like to verbalize, please raise your hand. I know Sam Hickey mentioned that he wanted to ask a question. So I'll allow um, Kamna to come in, I'll ask Sam, and then I have a provocation for everybody to sort of end with. So Kamna, please go ahead. I just wanted to very briefly, based on what Althea and Amanda have said, make a slight defense for disciplinary thinking. And I say this as someone that had uh, that, that did a master's in development studies and a PhD in development studies and now teach in development studies. And this interdisciplinarity of the subject um, poses a danger in losing some of the, in, in knowing the foundations of some of the concepts that we're using. And we perhaps can see this most clearly in our uses of, in, of intersectionality and the ways in which we're talking about it now. So when intersectionality comes into development, it is stripped and devoid of black feminist learning. Now that's the case for disciplinarity, for understanding the origins of these concepts and for, under, for understanding the, the theoretical traditions that they build upon. And I mean, I think it's quite possible to complete a development studies master's course and to never read Marx or to never read some of these perhaps people that we might consider as pivotal in politics courses or in international relations courses, but not in our own, or to not read Spivak if you don't take a geography master's program. So that's my case for um, a little bit of disciplinary uh, thinking. Thank you for making that case, Kamna. I think I uh, saw some nodding. So I think we're all in solidarity with your statements. Um, I do want to say this provocation before I invite Sam Higgy to verbalize his question is, you know, in the very beginning, we talked about the fact that we wanted to, in, the importance of centering race and racism in thinking and theorizing and, and talking about development also helps us to challenge not only the mainstream frameworks of development, but also the critical frameworks of development. So my question, I guess for all of us, and, and we can talk about this after Sam's question is, should it be the job, should it be our responsibility then, almost a moral obligation to work towards this structural transformation that will eventually put us out of jobs? <laughs> is, should that be our goal? I mean, we're thinking about the personal to the collective, but really something to think about. We can come back to this, but Sam, go ahead and, and verbalize your question. Great. Uh, thanks, Rob Tell. Um, I, I just, firstly, just before the question, I just wanted to echo uh, um, Amanda's disgust at the historic and racialized injustice around current patterns of vaccine distribution, which is, I think, shameful for a, you know, a generational and epic proportions. Um, we've said something about this publicly as an association. We should do more. But um, the, my question is: is um, it comes it's to, to the panel who've put together the race and development? Uh, round tables, which I really enjoyed and I think have flowed on really nicely from Rob Tell's plenary uh, two years ago at the DSA annual conference at, uh, at the Open University. And it's about a tension which I've noticed in the round tables. I think it came out particularly towards the end of the second one between the kind of typical really revolution versus reform 
uh, approach within within the movements really and it's something which came out in a panel that Indrajit Roy and myself organized yesterday morning where we discussed the implications of some of the challenges out there around decolonizing around global developments for um, the politics of developments and on the one hand we had a perspective around revolutionary that we, we have to sweep away not just the aid industry but development studies uh, that it's irrevocably tainted uh, with its association with racism and can't really be be rescued and so needs to be it's the bathwater which needs uh, draining away the second position was much more one of reform um, that uh, all of these perspectives need to be taken seriously along with other takes on inequality and deep rethinking is required and restructuring of the whole of the discipline area its institutions norms and so on um, and I think that tension was there in your uh, panels as well. What didn't come through in your panels, but did in ours, was a third position, which was one of resistance um, because of the way in which we constructed the panel, whereby there was some pushback, which I don't think can entirely be written off as white fear or white fragility, but was around a fear that a realist ontology of evidence-based knowledge production within development studies could be swept away by what was portrayed as a, a normative post-modern take on knowledge production. Um, so you have these three positions. I, I sense that most people in the panel, by stand please corrected, were in the middle reformist one. And if that's right, then my question to the panel is, is that even a possible, is, is that a possibility? Can development studies be reconstructed as a space within which maybe around the notions of social justice and social and solidarity uh, that can or should persist or not. Thank you, Sam, for, for those questions. I mean, it, it made me think about an article that was written a couple of years ago about um, the different frameworks of aid. So there's the aid radicals who talk about completely dismantling the system of aid. There's the aid reformists who talk about reforming the system as it were. And then there's the aid realists who say, yes, you know, we understand these systems are structured in, in systems of dominance and, and colonialism and slavery, um, but you, you don't throw the baby out with the bad water. So can, can we talk about development within those three frames, the, the radicalism, the reformism, but then also the realism? I think Kapana, you wanted to say something, so please do come in. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to come in on um, this whole question about, um, you know, evidence and the normative and all, and all of that, because, um, I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned postmodernism, I think we can end up conflating quite a few things when we when we talk about that, because, um, you know, I think those of us who are looking at, at at racism in in development um we have our own critiques of you know for example post-development right as an approach you know i think there's you know there's already quite a lot been said about for example the way in which it kind of uh can just you know end up being about kind of authenticity with the kind of glorification almost or romanticization at least of of poverty now maybe keep caricaturing it a little but there's definitely that element right and i think we've talked about the fact that you know movements um that we may or may not work with or in solidarity with um very often are about people's desire for actual transformation it's not about kind of sustaining something of the past it's often about transforming relationships both globally and also within communities and societies, right? Um, these are the kind of desires which we see animating these movements. Um, so, so I think, you know, it can end up being a kind of a, a bit of a dead end to go back to those sorts of uh, anxieties around, you know, the idea that, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, simply kind of embrace uh, postmodernist kind of assumptions in their entirety. Um, but I also, I mean, I also wonder whether we, we, we talk about development studies and there's no doubt that it is, it is kind of uh, absolutely kind of entrenched in terms of, of all of the things we've been talking about. But it's also kind of um, 
I think it's also it couldn't really exist without development institutions, without development practices. So, so this whole question of like what we do as as academics, I think in a way, um, our responsibility is is twofold. I think it's our responsibility to uh, those movements which those of us who see ourselves as radical scholars are actually trying to amplify, trying to um, support in a way and trying to, to uh, stand wherever possible in solidarity with, with all the kind of complexities and difficulties that involve. And the other one, of course, is, is to our students. And I think as development studies practice, um, sorry, academics, we, we very often are actually uh, find ourselves in classrooms where while the majority of people who teach are still white, a very large proportion of our students are people from you know, the so-called global south or are people of color from the global north who are themselves kind of encountering these, these uh, experiences on an everyday basis. So, so what is then our, our responsibility to them, both in, you know, in terms of actually uh, the kind of thinking we do together? Thank you, Kapana, for those rich words. Amanda, you wanted to come in, please do. Yes, I'll come in uh, quickly because I think some um, the parallels for me um, to the questions that uh, that you've asked. So you're talking about revolution, um, reformation, and resistance, and I know that from a theological perspective, we've been talking about forgiveness, uh, restoration, and reconciliation, re reconciliation and restoration, right? Uh, so when we have the conversations around reparations, it's a similar kind of thing that, you know, what do you do? Can this um, issue be solved um, without repar reparations? Can we ever get to a place um, that is acceptable if we don't go through the process uh, of, of that? Now, uh, <clears throat> racism for me is, uh, is perhaps the single um, most tragic uh, and worst crime um, against humanity in the history of the earth. That's what I would say, right? That I cannot see any other crime that is um, so systemic uh, and uh, that affects such a large group of people over millennia, right? Uh, and so to undo that as a system, um, there are days when I think revolution is the answer, and then there are days when I think actually um, reformation might be what gets us to that next stage, right? Um, and so to come to your question in terms of, so I'm, on that I'm talking about the bigger concept. Do I think that there should be reparations? Yes. Um, do I think that those reparations should be to, calculated to the penny? I don't know if that will be possible, right, as a next step. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a middle ground. So when you come to your specific questions, um, when I think of, you know, should we take, uh, should we be a bit more rebel revolutionary and say, forget development studies? I actually think that, uh, I don't know if you've listened to Adichie Chmamanda uh, giving her story, I think the danger of the single story she talks about when she was growing up, uh, she was, um, the books that she was reading uh, all the characters were white, right? The good characters uh, um, were white. So we cannot underestimate the power of academia in terms of what it does there to our brains and to our thinking. And, you know, I'm reminded of Bob Marley's Free Ourselves from Mental Slavery, right? Because actually the development studies module is in danger of perpetuating that mental slavery. And so, but, you know, I'm... I'm somebody I think who likes to find the middle ground. Would I say let's discard it completely? I think there has to be freedom of learning and different materials have to exist. But what I would go for would be what is the alternative? Can we have an alternative to the current uh, development studies so that they can exist side by side? Um, you know, they can uh, exist side by side. A development studies that is uh, uh, a better and a closer reflection of the struggles and the criminality of racism. And let's call it what it is. 
too many times in development studies, we try to airbrush um, some of these things in terms of people's experience. But let's have both. So that, I don't know, Sam, if that answers your question, but that would be my, my bit of, of being a revolutionist, you know, as, as, a, as a student who went to the University of Zambia and was on the streets during um, our fight for democracy, for multi-party democracy, I definitely have it in me that, you know, we need to push beyond the, bound, beyond the boundaries of comfort. And I think that academia needs to be pushed beyond its current comfortable position, right? Um, That's great. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm going to bring, we, we, we are a little bit over time, but I'm going to take the, the liberty as the chair to, to give us a few more minutes because I think I'd like to bring Kamna in for any last thoughts and then Althea in for any last thoughts and then I'll close it off. But really powerful, powerful um, comments coming out of this particular plenary. So Kamna and Althea, any last thoughts? Um, tr try to make them as brief as possible, please. Thank you. The two concepts that came from that last conversation about repair and responsibility, those are the words that stay with me. This is a conversation about repairing development and it is incumbent upon all of us who have a shared collective responsibility to make it better. Yeah, I think just quickly, um, I'm, I'm obviously more on the radical side of things, but it's difficult for me to see how the development, um, you know, structure as it is can be reformed um, and why it should be maintained, right? Because it is a structure that's tied to colonial, um, uh, colonialism, racialization, and genocide, right? So it's hard to see how that ever is going to produce a better world or, or equality. And I think we need to be honest about that, right? And also it's important to recognize that there are people who have talked about different ways of doing development and thinking about development for decades, right? So like Anthony Lane, who's a Bayesian scholar, you have Garfuna activists like um, Patrice Ventura and um, Luther Henry Castillo, who have talked about development in a, in a very different way. So when we think and talk about development, it doesn't always have to be about the development industry. What we need to do is re-envision what development is and recenter that tradition of scholarship and activism that is not new, right? So there is a, a reason that those voices have been marginalized and visibilized, and it is tied to the racial um, hierarchies, which are fundamental and at the foundation of the development project. And about the evidence issue, because this comes up a lot, I just want to say that we have to think about the fact that that you cannot div divorce knowledge production from power, right? And so there is a particular power dynamic that is um, embedded in discussions that see evidence as, or particular types of evidence or particular types of knowledge, and this is what um, Kamina and Jenna's panel was about, right? As being valid. So we should ask ourselves the question, if we don't challenge those things, who is it that benefits from that? Who is it that is framing the narrative, right? Who is it that maintains the power? And how does that reproduce inequality? And how does that maintain white supremacy in academia and in the sector? And so I think, yes, reform, we can work towards doing things better, but we have to keep an eye on revolution if we want a more equal world, if we want more justice. And if we don't, then we have to be honest about that. That's great. I'm going to wrap up by just saying, you know, reminding people of what's been said um, throughout the, the course of this two hours we've spent with each other, that racism is a crime against humanity. And part of addressing that and confronting it is about revolution, but it's also about radical solidarity and radical um, accountability amongst all of us, whether we work in the so-called development sector as an industry and whether we work in development as, as scholars and, and practitioners. So I'm gonna close by thanking um, Laura Canfield and Ben Jones of the UAE or UEA as co-conveners of DSA 2021. When we pitched this roundtable series to them, they were incredibly enthusiastic and even invited us to uh, have a closing plenary to, um, to bring all the roundtable compilations together. So I'd also like to thank DSA 2021 conference administrators, Christian Lawrenson and James Howard, who are always in the background doing the logistical heavy lifting, but never really get recognized. So I want to make sure to recognize them. I'd like to thank our panelists of the Race and Development Roundtables, all of whom have been recognized. And Amanda Mukwashi, of course, our plenary two discussant, who just was incredibly dynamic in all of her preached, preaching and, and, and speaking truths of power. Uh, last but certainly not least, I want to thank my sister colleagues of the Race and Development Working Group. It seems as if we've got a lot of work to do. So Jenna Marshall, Kamna Patel, Kapana Wilson, Althea Maria Rivas, I look forward to starting that revolution that we talked about during this plenary together. I want to remember, remind everybody to please stay safe, please stay healthy, take care of yourselves, 
and each other in the process. Um, until next time, and until the next DSA, take care, everybody. Have a good one.